So I feel um, very blessed um, to have this conversation with you. How you define joy. If you take away or erase these boundaries within you, you will see whether you sit, uh, stand or sleep, you will be joyful. Ninety-five percent of the human suffering is all generated from within. Self-help, it's called. Anxiety doesn't come knocking. You are becoming anxious. Hello. How are you? Karam, I was just <laughs> thinking of consulting you how to get these curls like this for Mia. Oh, you know, <laughs> I was just on Dr. Oz like 20, 30 minutes ago talking about hair. We did like a whole thing all morning about turning back the COVID clock on aging. <laughs> so I did like a hot oil treatment and it was a whole thing. So that's why I look the way I do. I usually don't look this like glammed up for podcasts. I no, usually have on my wonderful. regular stuff. Why? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I feel... I'm very blessed um, to have this conversation with you. Very blessed. <laughs> so let's get started because I don't want to um, take up too much of your time. So I'm going to officially do an intro and then we'll go from there. Okay. And it'll be very, very casual. Okay. I don't okay. know if you know anything about me, but um, I've been on this journey since I was seven. So it's my whole life. It's everything. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of New Growth. I am your host, Nikki Walton, and today I am joined by someone that doesn't need an introduction. He's a rock star guru. <laughs> he, is, <laughs> he is the true guru, and it's, it's not the man. It's the transparency that's there that God is, can shine through, the love can shine through. I call it love, but we can call it joy. We can call it consciousness, whatever you want to call it. It was before we were. So thank you so much for joining me, Sadhguru, today. Karam, this is Nikki. amazing. Wonderful talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so I So you are the beauty and I'm the beast, is it, in this whole game? <laughs> the beauty and the beast? No, <laughs> I don't see it that way. Not at all. <laughs> so, um, I, so I share your stuff on Instagram all day, all of your videos. You're very relatable, very down to earth. Um, a recent one, somebody was like, how do you feel? And you were like, how am I supposed to feel? I feel regular, you know, but I know, like I laughed. And for me, this whole journey has become about, it's like a Easter egg hunt. In every moment, I'm looking for the love or the joy that's already in the background, that's always already in the background. In some moments, it's easier. In other moments, it's more difficult. And when I'm really in that groove, there is no me and there's just that love, not even the moments, there's just that love, that joy. So I wanted to read a quote from Inner Engineering and just kind of get your definition of joy. Um, this is the one that I pulled. I have lots, but this is the one I love the most. <laughs> joy is not some elusive spiritual goal. It is simply the background that is needed for any aspect of your life to unfold magically and wonderfully. <laughs> so I just love to know like how you define joy. Well, uh, if you could define it, uh, it would not be worth pursuing it. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> because uh, see, we're calling it by different names. Essentially, it is life, if it's exuberant, in its exuberance, uh, it may be joy, it may be blissfulness, it may be ecstasy. Well, if it's relatable, it may become love. Uh, these are all different manifestations of exuberance of life. Mm. Joy is not a philosophy that you take on. Like right now, it's become in pursuit of happiness. Where are you chasing it? And why is it elusive? <laughs> because you think it's somewhere else. It's just that this life, when it functions in an exuberant manner, not in a depressed way, in an exuberant manner, that means if you open the cork, it is exuberant. If you close it and keep it, then it becomes depressed. So what is opening and closing when it comes to life? See, the fundamental thing is this, well, uh, 
once you've become a human being, what it means is, all other creatures are instinctively bound by boundaries. Like, uh, you may not have seen this in Uni United States, but if you were somewhere else, you would see this. If you were in the wild, you would see it. All carnivorous animals, let's say a dog, if you leave him outside, he goes on peeing all over the place. He doesn't have any urinary infection or problem. He's uh, setting his boundary by his mm -hmm. smell. Mm -hmm. So he's building his own little pea kingdom of whatever. It's a big thing for him <laughs> because for him to be clear what belongs to him, what do doesn't belong to him, he has to set a boundary. But once you become a human being, when I say a human being, in a way, the highest point of evolution on this planet. That means the finest life on this planet must be us. Well, we are proving to be otherwise, that's a different matter. But uh, actually, we are the finest life on this planet, most intelligent, most refined, most capabilities in terms of our faculties, everything. So if this is the finest life, if you look at the longing of this life, what you would see is, whoever you are right now, you want to be something more than who you are right now. This doesn't stop anywhere. Even if I make you the queen of this planet, I'm, I'm not thinking of that, I'm just saying, okay? That <laughs> <laughs> rock, that'd be awesome <laughs> <laughs> Even if you become the queen of this planet, uh, you will not be fulfilled, you will look at the moon, you will look at the other planets, you will... If I give you the whole, or whole solar system, you look at a galaxy. If I give you one galaxy, you will look at the next one. Because there is something within a human being wants to expand limitlessly. So this yeah. is the fundamental shift that happened between animal nature and human nature. Animal nature is always trying to fix its boundaries because its only goal is survival. Once you become a human being, you're always seeing how to expand your boundaries because what you call as human begins to kick in only when survival is taken care of. When survival is in question, we are like any other creature, biological entities of food, sleep, reproductive uh, needs uh, and survival, you know, essentially. So yeah. this dimension of longing to expand is not about more, it wants to expand limitlessly. So, the simplest thing is, if one is not identified with the limitations of one's own physical self, one's family, one's community, one's nationality, race, religion, caste, creed, whatever else, mm -hmm. if your identity is not like a limit on your ability to expand, then life will be naturally exuberant. When it's exuberant, yeah. one form of its expression is joyfulness. So joy is not a practice, joy is not a philosophy, joy is not your ideology in life, nor is joy uh, coming down to you from heaven, because this has happened to the world that all the beautiful things that human beings have, have been exported to heaven. If you mm. say peace, people say divine peace. If yeah. you say love, they say God is love. If you say joy, people will say heavenly joy. No, no, these are all human things. Your peacefulness, your joyfulness, your loving nature, all these things can happen within you when you are willing. When I say willing, when you are a willing piece of life, you become a willing piece of life only when your identities are not limited. If you put a limit on your identity, then you are willing with one set of people, you are unwilling with another set of people. So in this, it is corked and there is no exuberance to this, but if you take off this cork because this whole thing is just a mental thing that you have fixed up boundaries for yourself, mm -hmm. if you take mm -hmm. away or erase these boundaries within you, you will see whether you sit, uh, stand or sleep, you will be joyful. You will even sleep yeah. joyfully, I'm saying. <laughs> I love that. I, you know, thank you for saying that about sleep. I have heard and read that unless you are, unless that awareness that, um, unless you have that same awareness during sleep, you're not aware of that true awareness. You're not aware as that true awareness. Is that true? And if so, what does that look like? Because when I'm asleep, 
I'm sleep. No, no, when you sleep, just sleep. <laughs> Don't try to do anything else. <laughs> I go to sleep like with a mantra and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, there's some piece, some part that's gonna be aware. No, I sleep. And then I wake up and I'm like, well, there was sleeping and I'm, I'm peaceful now, but I don't know what happened during that time. It's like unconsciousness. See, uh, there are too many things, people coming to me and saying, Sadhguru, in which, which posture, should, uh, posture should I sleep? I yeah, said, at, you, at least when you sleep, <laughs> give up all this rubbish and just sleep. Sleep just like sleep. you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I sleep, apparently. <laughs> yes, that's how you should sleep. You must sleep like you're gone dead. If you sleep <laughs> like this, your uh, duration of sleep will naturally come down because you're sleeping deep. Because the body mm -hmm. needs that maintenance time. At that time, don't try to do anything. When your car is in maintenance, go and don't start the engine, you'll kill somebody. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let it be. Exactly. Only thing is, yeah. why these things have come up is, it is just that, See, awareness is again not an effort. It is like, uh, see, what are you aware of, what are you not aware of, simply depends on what is the brightness of your awareness. So we can uh, use an analogy like a light bulb. Suppose uh, you reduce the voltage for a light bulb, it becomes dim, you know. So if uh, the voltage is at a certain level, Suppose you're in a room where there are twenty-five people, voltage is so low that you can only see two people. In your experience, you think only two people exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you increase the voltage, you may see five people. Then you'll think, oh, there are five people. But if you put on the voltage full on, then you see twenty-five people. So your whole experience of life is dependent upon or determined by what is the voltage of your life energies? So yes. don't try to be aware. If you enhance the intensity of your life energies with the right kind of practice, then you will naturally be aware. This may also seep into so-called unconscious states like sleep, that you become gotcha. aware of that also. But don't try to be aware, all you will have is disturbed sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. So in the beginning of my spiritual journey, um, it was very much like law of attraction stuff. And I would try to feel exuberant. I would try to feel joyful. And over time, very short time, I learned that it did not work. And I would become aware in quiet moments during meditation or even just kind of sitting and doing nothing of a piece in the background that grew to become at times joyful. And a part of my mind would say, no, 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 we need to be super excited to make stuff happen. And as time went on, I could see that that was coming from that lack, from that corked being of, if I feel super excited, then I can bring something into my experience that is not already here. So the more I relax into that and recognize that it's already here, the more things have flowed in my life, I'm including this experience that I'm having by being able to ask you my questions and share my story. I feel that it is a manifestation of this very natural exuberance that's here. So you're telling me you somehow manipulated me into this? I guess so, <laughs> these energy. <laughs> You know, it's like when I'm super stressed out, I can, it's reflected. I see that reflected in the emails that I get and the responses I get from people. Um, but when I feel, not feel with this body necessarily, like not me purposefully being happy or fake smiling, but an inner smile that's just there as long as I remember to turn to it. As long as I remember to become aware of it and kind of live out from there, even if Nikki's upset or nervous. I was, I told you I was on Dr. Oz earlier today. And I didn't even like really have a lot of preparation time for it. So to have that heart racing, but still be aware of peace or even joy in the background, for me, it's like it's very anchoring. And I don't believe I'm deluding myself. So there are two Nikki's, huh? That's dangerous, huh? Ooh, tell me more. <laughs> because I, <laughs> uh, I saw in your bio that you're also a psycho... What therapist? Therapist. Huh? Psychotherapist. Yeah, licensed psychotherapist. So I went to know... school in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. <laughs> two two Nikki's means either you're schizophrenic or you're possessed. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so Am you... I possessed with love? Can I be possessed with love? <laughs> can I be possessed by joy? <laughs> you can possess love. Why should love possess you? 
Oh, okay. You can possess love, joy, ecstasy in your life. You're capable of mm -hmm. possessing all this in your life. These must be your greatest possessions, that you're blissful. <laughs> People yes. think they have a car or a home is a big possession. No, uh, the dollars are not the best possession to have. They're useful. Right. They're useful right. to create a certain amount of comfort for us. But the best possession to have is blissfulness. You don't have to be possessed by it because, see, we are looking at these dimensions of life or aspects of life as some kind of quantities or some kind of commodity that we must have it. Yes. Happiness is not something that you will have, joy is not something that you will have. You just can become happy, you can become joyful, isn't it? I have joy in my life, what is that? Have you… have you stored it in a balloon or a box or where, mm -hmm. I'm asking? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as having joy. You can become joyful, you can become loving, you can become blissful. So becoming blissful, becoming joyful, becoming peaceful, what does it mean? See, if your body becomes pleasant, we call this health. Everybody wants it. Body is pleasant right now, this is health. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If your mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call this love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. Mm -hmm. If your very life energies become pleasant, we call this bliss. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call this success. Only to create pleasantness in your surroundings, you need the cooperation of other forces and people. Because creating pleasantness in the surroundings is a skill of a certain kind. You must be able to put many forces together, otherwise it won't work. But pleasantness of body, pleasantness of mind, pleasantness of emotion and pleasantness of energies are one hundred percent your business, one hundred percent. There's nobody else involved in this, but right now, we have handed this over to so many people yeah. that somebody can determine, someone else can determine whether you are happy or unhappy. If someone can determine what happens within you, would you call this slavery? Mm. It is the worst form of slavery. Somebody determines what you should wear, what you should eat, where you should be, this, else, this itself is called slavery. But if yeah. someone can determine whether you can be happy or unhappy, somebody can make you peaceful, somebody can make you… Uh, put you into turmoil, this means you are deeply, deeply enslaved. This mm -hmm. enslavement has happened simply because you have not taken charge of your faculties. Your own thought, your own emotion, your mental and psychological structures and your physical body not taking instructions from you. If… if your mind was taking instructions from you, would you keep it uh, blissful or miserable? Um, absolutely blissful. <laughs> absolutely blissful. Peaceful, joyful, what, yes. Sometimes what you want for your neighbor may be debatable, but <laughs> what yes. you want for yourself is hundred percent clear, highest level mm -hmm. of pleasantness, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. So when this is the case, why such a simple thing is not happening? Can I tell you a small story? Please. This is not really a story, this is what happened to me. When I was mm -hmm. just twenty-five years of age, one day I was just sitting on a small hill near uh, my native town, I don't know, you may not be fa familiar with India. Uh, a little bit, I've been once, oh. but just to southern India, yeah, in Mumbai. Mumbai, okay. Oh, just mm -hmm. the wrong place to go. <laughs> no, Mumbai, I'm coming back and Mumbai I'm going people northern won't India like it, time. but I'm just saying that's not India. <laughs> I'm that's doing Mumbai. North India next time, as soon as everything clears up. No, no, you must up, come south. Back. In south… Oh, coming south? Yeah. Yeah? Mumbai what is part? not really south, it's somewhere central India. Further central. south is… Uh, where we are and uh, it's a more beautiful part of India. North is just plains, south is full of mountains and… Is it near like Goa? F yeah, Goa and further down. Okay, yep. okay. I want to come to Goa too. So this is a city called Mysore, where there's a small mm -hmm. hill 
in the town and I was just okay. sitting there and suddenly I realized, suddenly I exploded into a state where every mm -hmm. cell in my body was dripping ecstasy. I realized if I just don't mess with my mind, I'm ecstatic. Yes. Then after a few weeks of this experience, that it became such a profound experience for me, and then I decided, <laughs> I was twenty-five years of age, and mm. I decided and made a plan, in the next two and a half years, I will make the whole world ecstatic. Because it's so simple, you don't have to do anything. If you simply sit here without messing around with your mind, you're ecstatic. Okay. So on that day, the population was just 5.6 billion people. So mm. I thought uh, in two and a half years, I made a plan how I will make the whole world ecstatic. See, now it's uh, 39 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, people say we've touched around a billion people. But that's yeah. not my idea of the world. My idea of the world is 7.6 billion people. But mm -hmm. it took me a certain amount of time to realize how invested people are in their miseries. They're yeah. so invested that even if you show them the greatest possibility, they don't want to leave what is familiar. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so why is this happening to the world? Why so much suffering? See, physical things that happen to us, there is war, there is famine, there is calamities, these are different things. Well, this causes physical pain. Mm. But right now, if you look at human beings, only about two to three percent, maybe five percent of suffering is because of physical causes from outside. Ninety-five percent is self-inflicted suffering. Physical situations can change, they need not cause suffering to us. Right now, everybody is suffering the pandemic. Those who got infected, those who lost their lives, those who lost their dear ones, it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. All others are suffering. What is it? They're all worried about the economy, they're worried about the future, they're worried about something. I'm not saying it is not an issue. All I'm saying is, see right now, what could happen at the most? Maybe in another six months' time or one year's time, we may have to live like how we were living ten years ago. Mm. Or maybe twenty years ago. Twenty years ago, believe me, life was not very bad, it was good. Right. Maybe we'll have to live little with little less. Maybe we will have to live like how our parents lived. Today, how many, for example, I'm saying, this is not against the beauty consultation, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> for example, how many pairs of clothes your grandparents had and how many you have or this generation has, if you look at it, it's probably five, ten times more. Yeah. Isn't it? Except so, for in this case, huh? I have a uniform. I have a uniform, I don't buy clothes like that. <laughs> T-shirts and skinny jeans. You're not good for economy then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I do order a lot of food, but less clothes. <laughs> so, essentially, when, when the caveman lived here also, he was also some... Uh, among them also, some were happy, some were not happy. That is not because of the conditions in which they lived in, it is because of the condition of their minds, their ability yeah. to use their own faculties. What is it that human beings are suffering if you look at it? Well, they are capable of suffering what happened ten years ago. Yeah. And of course they suffer what may happen day after tomorrow already. So this means that they are not suffering life, they are suffering two most important faculties in a human being, that is a vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination, they are mm -hmm. suffering these two things, which is most unfortunate. Because what essentially you're saying is, this evolution of my intelligence is my problem. Right now, human beings are essentially suffering their own intelligence. If you... Yes. Ha if they had half the brain that they have, they would sit here peacefully, no meditation would be needed. If they had the brain of an earthworm, they would sit very peacefully. So essentially you're complaining, why have you given me so much intelligence? We're telling nature, why so much intelligence? So in Florida, people soak it in alcohol every three days 
in the week they keep it in alcohol yep. two days they book, yep. put other kinds of chemicals you know to mm -hmm. keep the brain preserved so that it's not working too much yes that's exactly right <laughs> so that's exactly right essentially <laughs> you didn't you did not figure out how to handle your own intelligence exactly so the fundamental thing is you have been given the most complex and sophisticated machine on the planet, that is this human mechanism. But you are trying to blunder through your life without even reading the user's manual. This is only... this is the only problem human beings have. Outside problems, we will deal with them to the extent that we can, that's all we can do. But ninety-five percent of the human suffering is all generated from within, self-help it's called. Self-help. So, brass tacks, this is what I want to know. For you, and you might not experience anxiety or fear or worries anymore in where you are, but for someone that's on this path and if anxiety comes knocking at the door, how does this look in practice? You know, staying aware or staying aware as bliss, this natural exuberance that's there even when the emotions are strong or the thoughts are heavy? Well, uh... <laughs> Let me tell you a little story, okay? Yeah. This happened in southern India, further south than where you went, okay? Mm -hmm. They came to a local village. Somebody came to a local village and they asked, how far is Isha Yoga Center, which is our yoga center? The local boy who was sitting there by the street side said, it is 24,996 miles. They said, what? It's that far away? He said, yeah, the way you're going. If you turn around, mm -hmm. it's four miles. Yeah. Exactly. So right now you're so saying it's... anxiety comes knocking. Anxiety yes. doesn't come knocking. You are becoming anxious. Why mm -hmm. are you becoming anxious? Because your imagination is unbridled, your memory is uncontrollable, it's mm -hmm. running right within yourself. So mm -hmm. essentially, it's your inability to use your own faculties. Suppose it so happens, your hand became an independent state by itself mm. and started punching you in the face. <laughs> if somebody That's else... That's what the mind is doing, the mind is punching me in the face <laughs> <laughs> If somebody else tries to do this, we know how to distance ourselves, we know how to go yes. away, how to handle them. Suppose your own hand starts hitting you in the face, what is the answer for this? They will lock you away. <laughs> you have to get control of your hand and not do that. Yes. Either your hand should take instructions from you or somebody will tie mm -hmm. it down or maybe they will mm -hmm. amputate it if it goes out of control. All these mm -hmm. things right now, that's all that's happening with your mind. Your thought, your emotion are running away on their own. They're not taking instructions from you. All your faculties should take instructions from you only then they're worthwhile faculties, otherwise they're a big nuisance. Right now, yes. unfortunately, most people are making their own intelligence into a nuisance. Mm -hmm. See, in my understanding of life, I feel intelligence is a solution for everything. But right now, everybody is trying to prove intelligence is the only problem they have. Mm. So anxiety doesn't come knocking, you become anxious. You become anxious and then because you're in this practice, you recognize I've become anxious and then see what's also here or what is here. Instead of walking, like you said, 5,000 miles in the other direction, recognizing what's here. Is that the practice? Is that what you do in a moment like that? For people that are still dealing with that heavy mind. See, all they have to see is the fundamental thing that they have to absolutely recognize is human experience is caused from within, pleasant or unpleasant. Mm -hmm. Whether it's joy or misery, both are caused from within us. What is happening from within us must happen the way we want. The world mm -hmm. will never happen the way you want hundred percent. Right. World will never ever happen one hundred percent the way you want. I'm saying your own family, if there are two people or four people in the family, they will never happen hundred percent the way you want them. If they happen fifty-one percent your way, you are the winner <laughs> uh, No, I'm not talking about the election, I'm just 
thing. <laughs> <laughs> We are not touching that. <laughs> very, very happy. <laughs> I'm saying if you... if your life is happening little more your way than somebody else's way, it's great. Yeah. But it will yeah. never ever happen hundred percent your way. Yeah. It's just not possible. So, what is around you, the world around you, people around you, life around you will never happen your way. But this mm -hmm. one life must happen your way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If this yeah. one doesn't happen your way, you're a lost case. Absolutely. There are no uh, quick fixes, there are no adjustments to make. You need to just understand this, human experience is caused from within. The seat of your experience is within you. You are not sitting there, that's a problem. You are not at mm -hmm. an individual, that is the problem. You are identified mm -hmm. with too many things. Right mm -hmm. now, the way peop when people say, my life, if somebody says, my life, you are supposed to look, where is this life? Is it in the office? Is it in the bank? Is it in his car? Is it in his home? Is it in his wife or husband or children? Where is this life? Because he thinks all this is his life. This is not your life. These right. are arrangements you made to facilitate this life to happen in the best possible way, isn't it? Mm, yes, definitely. You made these arrangements, give you the most comfort. but now you're mistaking the arrangements to be life. Right. You sit on a chair for your comfort. After some yeah. time, you think you are the chair. You know what happens to you? You will walk around with the chair stuck to you. That's a bad way to live. Right <laughs> yes. now, that's all that's <laughs> happening. With this... I see. With this, there is anxiety. With this, there is struggle. If you clearly come to this place, what is you, what is not you? if there's a distinction. Mm -hmm. There's a simple process that we have set up. Millions of people are doing this around the world today. It's called as Isha Kriya. It's a, a mm -hmm. the free downloadable for anybody who wishes to do it. This is a simple process to create a little distance between what is you, what is not you. When I say what is you, what is not you, this very physical body is something that you gathered over a period of time, isn't it? You were not born mm -hmm. like this, you, it happened. No. So what is this? That lot of food that you're ordering, I'm sure you're not eating that lot of food looking at you <laughs> <laughs> I like fried, greasy, cheesy things. I'm doing better though. You, maybe you're looking at them, you're not eating them, I can see that <laughs> <laughs> So, the food that you've eaten has right now transformed itself mm -hmm. into your body and be like this. Where did the food come from? Just the soil that you walk upon. Is food... food became like this. Mm -hmm. Someday, once again, this will become part of the earth. So right. this is yours, your... this body is yours, but it's not right. you. Similarly, right. your psychological structure, these are millions of impressions that you have taken in, and it's formed itself in a... given itself a certain shape and a form and a quality. Now, this is also something that you gathered. What you mm -hmm. gather can be yours, but it will never ever be you, you, isn't it? So if you bring yes. the distinction, all your problems are over. Got it. That little distance is needed. And is it a matter of remembering that distinction? Oh, uh, see, if you make your life energies very intense, mm -hmm. very intense, you will see naturally physical body and your psychological structure will move little away, it'll give you little space. It's like, see, now I'm wearing loose clothes, Mm -hmm. Always you're conscious that these are clothes. Mm -hmm. Suppose you wear really uh, super thin, tight, skin tight nylon clothes. After some time you don't know which is you and which is your body. It becomes one with you because there is no space. So where there is no space, there is no perception of what it is. Because there's no perception, you don't know how to deal with it. It's like this, mm -hmm. On this planet, we went on arguing whether this planet is flat or round, flat or round, you know, this debate was going on and you know that Galileo stuff and all that. Yes, yes. Anyway, this would have yes. continued forever, but the moment we took off and we started flying, we could clearly see it is round. We went exactly. and stood on the moon and looked down, one hundred percent it was round, all right? What is it that gave us this perspective? Because a little distance. Similarly, mm -hmm. a little distance from your body, a little distance from the mental structure if you create, you have absolutely know where the handlebars are and you can hold them and manage them the way you want. Yes. 
I love that. So it's the distance, recognizing that you are not the body, recognizing that you are not the mind, still being there and seeing those, that energy come through and move through, but knowing that it's not you. Does that sound near <laughs> what you're saying? Yes, you will get to learn to use the body and mind to its best. Your body yeah. and your mind should work for you, never against yeah. you. So what you're calling as anxiety, what you call as misery, any form of unpleasantness that generates from within you, either in the form of ill health or misery, essentially it means your own system is working against you. Right, right. Now that's beautiful. I love how you make everything very, very simple. Um, I also wanted to tell you that I'm, I'm taking neem in the morning because ah. of you. I've been doing that now for at least a month, at least a month now. So, so you thank you. I tried to do the um, turmeric too, but it gave me indigestion. So <laughs> I haven't been able to... <laughs> oh, there is a certain way to consume <laughs> but that. But neem is great. Neem is great. It'll bring certain yeah. transfusions to you. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it will... Once you have neem early morning, nothing seems bitter through the day <laughs> Yeah, I take it every morning, it's the first thing I do. Mm -hmm. Neem is the first thing I take when I wake up in the morning now, and it's been for a, at least a month. Like, I don't have much of a morning routine except for just kind of marinating as this love, you know, and that exuberance. And then <laughs> I do a little reading, and then I take my neem, and then I get started with my to-do list or jumping into my phone. I stopped checking my phone and my news feed first thing, and that changes everything. So just kind of remind yourself that you're not the person. Oh, maybe we have mind. to say one more thing. I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not the phone. I'm not the phone, yes, because it's become an ex <laughs> it's another appendage. So in the morning, I'll say not just I'm not this, I'm not Nikki, I'm not the mind, I'm not the phone. <laughs> uh, I, I think like that this one. This is I'll more add. important than the body and mind for a whole lot of people. Man, it's become it's a disgusting addiction. How my thumb will just go to Instagram. It'll just go to my email. I Are check you it doing this in the sleep, huh? Are you yeah, doing this? Absolutely. In <laughs> mm -hmm. Not healthy, not healthy at all. It's better now that I've, you know, I'm not checking it as soon as I wake up. And I have set alarms on all of my apps that shut off after an hour, but you put your own passcode back in to get access back to it. So it still takes like a conscious moment to be like, am I going to re-access this app? And usually I do, but it's still a moment to decide. I can choose if I'm going to continue to be mindless. Um, but yeah, no, Neem has been an excellent addition to my routine, so thank you so much for that. Neem is a wonderful thing. Uh, it will also reduce the number of cancerous cells in our body. It has incredible yeah. benefits. It is uh, one leaf that's found on this planet who has a very complex chemical system, nearly 104 to 105 different types of chemical compositions are there in that. It is a... it's a wonder leaf. So, mm. I'm glad you're in Florida and you must be getting some fresh neem. Yes, I <laughs> am, I am. There's a farm here, not too far, in Brandon, Florida. And so that's where I get my neem from and it's fabulous, so... Um, I know that we're actually coming near the end of our time together and I wanted to give you a chance to just let my audience know where they can keep up with you at. Well... Oh, well, I'm not good at this. You should only say these things <laughs> well, Maybe I'll record like a short thing at the end for us. <laughs> we are, uh, <laughs> like, we are here Instagram in Tennessee, <laughs> on the border of Tennessee and Georgia, uh, near McMinnville. This is where the Isha Institute of Inner Sciences is. And of course, we are in southern India, a much larger center out there. And uh, this is a place you must visit. It's very, very... It's an extremely beautiful space out here. And apart from that, of course, there is an engineering.com and whatever else. There is a Sadhguru app, if you download that, everything is there in that. It's called the Sadhguru app, it's free downloadable. And there are various meditations that... Uh, guided meditations that one can practice from this. And also simple, very simple forms of yoga which are called as Upa Yoga which one can do or practice uh, without any risk of doing it wrong, uh, yeah. uh, because proper yoga must be done under care. Just doing it mm -hmm. from a book or a video is not a good thing to do, but this is called Upa Yoga, which are very, very simple processes that anybody can learn to do. So, 
As I said, uh <laughs> now I'm kind of condemned to be a failure in my life, that the entire <laughs> world being blissed out is, mm. uh, you know, not happening. So, uh, I'm only trying to increase my percentages, so tell them that, that let me be a little better failure than what I am right now. <laughs> but I'm a blissful <laughs> failure, so don't worry about me. <laughs> blissful failure, I aspire to be a blissful failure. <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> Wonderful talking Thank to you. Thank you so much. You must I come and visit us you. here. You must come and visit oh, us at Tennessee. Oh, I am absolutely coming that way. I love Tennessee. I used to drive through the mountains all the time. I'm between Missouri and North Carolina, so I'll definitely head up there. Do you all have silent retreats? I crave a good yes, silent uh, retreat. There's a 21-day silent retreat going on right now. You can join the three-week thing. I wish I was there. I, I think yeah, I need that in my life. And whenever I feel the need to go away, like to a cave, I remind myself that I, that exuberance, that would be we okay, also have is a here cave. where I am. We oh, also I would have go a there. cave. I didn't know that you're drawn to the caves. <laughs> Anywhere that's quiet, 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 quiet. And, but then, like I said, it's always like a constant reminder, even though you're not on the beach, even though it's not quiet in this house because the two kids are yelling, the peace is here. The exuberance is here and just identifying <laughs> as that as opposed to the need for quiet, you know? I'm here till end of December. We'll be glad to see you when you come. Hmm? Namaskar. Yes, I'll be Thank there. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.